welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Duke. And I'm Bajo. And I'm Bindi. Uh, it's nice to be back, Bajo. I like how you and Hex only invite me on the show when one of you has something important to do. Well, Hex is on an epic quest over at E3 all week, so we're very happy that you could fill in. Look, I will stay to the end if you promise to trade me a Psyduck for a Snubble. Oh, that's a fair deal, I think, yeah. Well, coming up on the show this week, we finally hail to the King Baby with Duke Nukem Forever. Oh my god, Duke, thank you. I'll go down with you anytime. And hold on to your Wiimote, so I've managed to convince Barjo to give We Dare a thorough once over. In fact, I was appalled that you and Hex didn't review that masterpiece on its release. I mean, I don't know how we missed that one. And it's time to go backwards compatible as I investigate the forgotten art of the idle animation. But first, can you guess the game for this week? 13 is not a lucky number. So any big gaming news this week, Barjo? Or just all the big E3 announcements? <laughs> the usual rubbish, then. Good game! The annual Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles has delivered another deluge of exciting game and hardware announcements. Microsoft stuck to its guns by showing new Halo titles, as well as a slew of Kinect-enabled games and updated entertainment options such as a live TV service. Sony pushed its upcoming portable, the PlayStation Vita, along with a bunch of new games, while also announcing a PlayStation-branded 3D TV and glasses. And as anticipated, Nintendo created plenty of chatter by unveiling a new HD console called the Wii U. Utilising a touchscreen wireless tablet controller that's capable of motion control and streaming gameplay, the Wii U is not scheduled to surface until late 2012. Games publisher Interplay may be heading for bankruptcy, putting projects such as a new Earthworm Jim and Fallout MMO on the chopping block. According to its latest reports, Interplay's cash balance had fallen to only $3,000 this year, with a capital deficit of almost $3 million. A full sale or merger may be the company's only chance of survival. Over 100 people who worked on Team Bondi's L.A. Noir have been left out of the game's credits. I don't know nothing about that. As a response, a number of ex-workers have created a website featuring the names of all those who were left out. As for why the names were not included, the site states the workers were not credited as they were not involved in the last several months of production due to redundancies that took place as production on the game wound down. I can't believe it. A person seems so alive and then they're gone. Seamus Blackley, one of Microsoft's key players in the creation of the first Xbox, is planning to launch a new game studio. In recent years, Blackley has been a talent agent for major developers such as Insomniac Games and Respawn Entertainment. The studio's name and current projects are yet to be revealed. Good game! Actually, I might just sit like Hex for this review in case you're missing a... Oh, yeah. Well, the dust has finally settled on the salacious controversy and we've worked up the courage to review the raunchy party game We Dare by French developer Ubisoft. Yes, if anyone was going to figure out a way of turning the harmless Nintendo Wii into a kinky sex device, it'd have to be the French. Mm. Well, in fairness, most of the work done on Wii Dare was by Ubisoft Milan, but I guess the Italians are just as naughty. And what about this trailer? It's a far cry from Olivia Newton-John in Wii Fit or Helen Mirren's feet. Yeah, I like how the actors really enjoyed themselves there, didn't they, Barge? I mean, they just couldn't help but erupt into spontaneous, natural laughter. Ubisoft really went for a sexy image when marketing this game. Just look at the manual. Check out this chair, straight out of a 19th century brothel. It's like, it's like something you'd find in Paris Hilton's brain. <laughs> yeah, it's festooned with the aftermath of a debauched all-nighter. There's the fluffy handcuffs on the chair, the bra over the side, and of course, the little pink rubber duck. Oh yes, oh, no romantic evening should be without one of those. Bindi and I were quite keen on reviewing We Dare, actually, because we thought it might help us out in intimate situations. And I think it's fair to say that embarking on this game, we were both a little nervous. Hey, hi. Yeah, good. How you doing? It's quite bouncy, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's it's good. It's com comfy. Um, do you want another pillow? Okay. Oh no no no! You you have the pillow. Um, it's fine. So we tried to get into the mood with some nice wine. I'll just, I'll just have a little bit. Oh, a bit. You right? yeah. Hmm. And of course, we use the adequate protection on our Wemos. Oh, you can't be too careful. Put your hand in.
But once we delved into the game, we found the content was surprisingly unsexy and aimed more for cuteness and humour. Yeah, you can play We Dare with up to four players, and although there is a one-player option, we should warn you up front, it's not much fun that way. Uh, plus, you do feel rather foolish boogieing onto that naughty screen all on your own. It's definitely a party game, and the more the merrier. You start by generating your own character, and I think that's important when you're playing with friends to have interesting needs. Yes, plus I was delighted that they actually included a skin colour pale enough to match Barju and me in real life. Mm. You can choose from five so-called moods, and these moods are actually groups of mini-games. There are 37 mini-games all up, which sounds reasonably generous until you discover that almost half of them are extremely similar dancing games. I'm a right time favourite They're a bit El Cheapo too, especially compared to any other dedicated dancing game out there. Also, after a while you realise you're not dancing to pop hits, you're dancing to really poor covers of pop hits. And they feel kind of plastic. No, Danny. A nice variation is a minigame with the rather un-PC title Blind as a Bat, where you guide your blindfolded partner in a dance, and you have to actually force their body to match the moves on screen. <laughs> Uh, although the game does not come with a blind policy, you will need to find a tea towel or something. As for other mini games, there's climbing up and down a building, a trivia game where you have to guess the right question first, and a, a quite strange one where you have a time limit to go and find a household item and then bring it back and stand on the balance board. There's also charades where one player secretly listens into their Wiimote for the clue, and that's pretty inventive, really. <laughs> Plus, there's physical challenges like doing the limbo, and trying to stay on a motorised rodeo bull. Ooh. 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 Now, you're probably thinking all this sounds about as sexy as a box of crayons, so the, the question is, where does We Dare actually deliver on that suggestive marketing? Well, if you were hoping for a spanking minigame, like the one in the trailer, uh, that's false advertising, there's no such thing. Yes, that's a flying game where you actually have to balance the other player on your lap through a bunch of rings, and sadly, it's spank-free. Quite good for your abs, though. Yeah, where things do finally get a bit naughty is in a game called The Big Apple. Uh, you have to actually press A and B on the Wiimote using your face, and not your hands. You know, not, not the most hygienic of mini-games. No. Honestly, I found this so gross with Bindi that I just swapped him out for a mannequin. Thanks. Uh, the other sexy mini-game is one called Who Dares Wins, and this is literally a stripping game. <laughs> the Wii balance board weighs each person, and then whoever removes the most clothing is declared the winner. Yes, it's not very scientific. You can easily turn up in a motorcycle helmet, take it off and just win that way. Mm, yes! <sighs> Arjo? Bajo. Look, anyway, after our game session, we, we actually loosened up quite a bit, you know, and one thing kind of led to another, and, uh, well, I must say, though, the, you know, the morning after, things were a little bit awkward. Uh, I, I'm not even going to tell you where we found the Wiimotes. You know, but, but all up, We Dare is basically fun rather than raunchy, so despite the publicity, do not expect much sexiness from this game. Particularly when you and I are playing it. Final thoughts, Bajo? I think there are too many dancing mini-games, and the other mini-games aren't that great anyway. Also, you spend an eternity in the loading screens, and, you know, this is a terrible game for terrible people, so I'm giving it two out of ten rubber chickens. Look, I mean, if you've got friends over who aren't really gamers, and you don't want them to be anyway, then We Dare is, is probably suitable. I mean, it's, it's not fiddly to learn, like, say, Mario and Sonic at the Olympics with, with all that training. You know, these mini-games are so easy, you can be the world's biggest technophobe and dive right in. I mean, even Alan Jones or Tony Abbott could probably manage We Dare, uh, although I do not recommend them as party guests. Uh, in the grand scheme of all things gaming, I give this three rubber chickens out of ten.
game. You ever notice what happens in those occasional moments when we put our controllers aside, maybe for a, a tea break or to get the cat off your face? When we stop prodding at our video game heroes to run and jump and do whatever we command, well, sometimes those little dudes on the screen grasp the opportunity of our absence to remind us that maybe they have a mind of their own. Now these magic mannerisms are called idle animations. When the player ceases all input, these animations start up to, to goad us into picking up the controls again. When I started gaming in about 1984, Rockford from the Commodore 64 Smash Boulder Dash was one of the first characters ever to urge the player to get back to waggling that eight-directional joystick. He did it by blinking and tapping his blocky foot. But the real heyday of the idle animation came in the early 90s when the surge of 16-bit platformers brought with it a host of colourful champions ripe for a bit of downtime animation. One of the most memorable is Earthworm Jim on the Super Nintendo, his stretchy pink invertebrate form made for a number of mirthful moments if left to his own devices. While he didn't have the same earthy humour, the speedy Sonic the Hedgehog was only too happy to show the player his impatience at having to stand motionless for too long. And then there was the resplendent Boogerman on the Mega Drive who whiled away the microseconds by mining for a mouthful of nose gold. Commander Keen took a genuine break from the action by settling down to read a jolly good book and Rayman took advantage of having a detachable torso to keep himself occupied while the player was distracted. Today's platformers also have a few idle animations tucked away, like how Splosion Man takes a break from self-detonation. Back when games finally moved into the far more immersive phase of 3D graphics, we could start to admire our inactive characters from many camera angles, and this meant those overworked animators started to inject even more subtle indicators of life into their digital babies. I'm a tiger. When we put down the controller in Super Mario 64, we saw into the very psyche of Mario himself as he got sleepy and started dreaming of pasta dishes. Ah, spaghetti. Ah, ravioli. Ah, mamma mia. That cutting-edge chipmunk Conker had a good use for spare moments of dead gameplay by whipping out a Game Boy, a yo-yo, and a magazine. A trick that wasn't lost on Donkey Kong when he returned on the Wii, though this time the handheld was upgraded to a DS. I assume he's not playing that terrible Doctor Who game. The graffiti-spreading revolutionaries of Jet Set Radio Future reveled in their spare seconds of freedom to shake out some stress. And to teach you a lesson for carrying a large bird in your backpack, Banjo was impatiently pecked by Kazooie if you ever let him stand motionless for too long. A personal favourite of the Good Game staff, the ungodly Catwoman on PS2, rewarded the player for ceasing to play its horrid excuse for action with a, a sexy dance from a pixel-perfect Halle Berry. Closer, baby. But the sexy times don't stop there. The roving eyes of Carl C.J. Johnson in GTA San Andreas actually seized control of the in-game camera if you left him idle on the streets of Los Santos. Time for a hot shower, Holm. And Lara Croft gave you a bit of this to encourage you to continue raiding her tomb. Of course, these days, video game characters are, are in a constant state of animation. They almost never stop looking around or breathing heavily, so idle animations have become even stranger in order to stand out. Stand back. I got an idea. The super-powered Cole in Infamous will amuse himself by juggling electricity. 
And if you stop and wait long enough in Mass Effect 2, your companion Legion will bust out the robot. Shepard Commander. I have to get back to work. Acknowledged. Now, self-generated behaviour from on-screen characters is one thing, but did you know that first-person shooters also indulge in idle animation? Just because you can only see a, a pair of virtual hands stuck out in front of you is no deterrent. In Valve's compelling Half-Life, Gordon Freeman risks losing a finger if you leave him with a snark for too long. Duke Nukem shows he isn't one to be kept waiting. What are you waiting for? Christmas? Come on. And the moody Metro 2033 is laden with entertaining weapon juggles and detailed hardware examinations. So next time you take a bio break, stick around for a bit. Spare a thought for the animator's sweatshop and you just might catch your programmable pal in the middle of an unannounced performance. The Colossal Cave Adventure was the first game that really cap captured me. It was a text adventure. Um, I played it on a CPM-based system that my father had built. Welcome to adventure. Would you like instructions? No. It was all text. You had to completely use your imagination. It would, you know, you're standing at the end of a, uh, of a of a road in front of a small brick house. I think is how it began. We're standing at the end of the road before a small brick building and just a little parser and you can say like north, south, east, west, you know, look, you know, pick things up, put things down. It kind of showed me that games could be more than just Pac-Man or Donkey Kong, that you could, you could become an, involved in a world. You are in a valley in the forest, beside a stream tumbling along a rocky bed. I, mean, I was very young when I, when I played this, nine, ten years old, and so I figured out how to examine the source code of the game, and I learned how to read, you know, elements of the source code, and it, it also kind of inspired me to become a game maker, because it taught me how to build a, a dimensional area, which is like a way to kind of arrange rooms and kind of have logic for what, how, how a, a space could be connected to another space and how a player could pass through these spaces, and I, I kind of constructed some of my own little, you know, text adventures, and it taught me that kind of first rudimentary elements of programming, and that's kind of inspired me to become a programmer. Do you really want to quit now? My job is to kick ass, not make small talk. Good game! Never before have I put a game in my console with as much excitement and trepidation as Duke Nukem Forever. It's finally here after an eternity in development hell, and the good news is there's a lot to like. Welcome to Earth, bitch. <laughs> Tentacles back to Japan, you freak. Pull the brake! Come on! Pull it again! Who's your daddy now? Aliens have arrived on Earth once again to cause mischief and steal chicks for impregnation. Such a classic tale, Barge Army. The president tries to calm the situation, but Duke knows these foes too well. And when his own chicks, the wholesome twins, get captured, he's forced to take matters into his own hands and kill everything. My Kung Fu is still the best. Come get some. After you've pushed X on about a million things, you'll make your way out of the Duke cave through a variety of locations. There's the Duke Casino. A Wild West Zone, which has some okay driving bits to it. Alien Hives, and our personal favourite, the kitchen. Ooh, nasty. I quite like the shrinking levels, Bindi, especially Duke's first reaction when he gets shrunk for the first time. What the fuck? Yes, yes, there aren't enough games where you get shrunk down, are there? And I enjoyed fighting the rats, for example. And also, when you're very small, uh, some of the normal enemies turn into these gigantic bosses, which is pretty thrilling. I did find it hard to see where to go sometimes, though. Like The levels are all very old-school 3D realms, which means that besides the odd subtle arrow and glowing objective, you will spend much of your time looking around just trying to work things out. 
And when you go off track, you do sometimes stumble into some fun little fan service. That's one dead space marine. At first I found that lack of direction really frustrating and it bugged me. Bojo, don't be such a noob. But then after a while I started to find that a bit refreshing, you know, you're not being funneled down this narrow pipe of linear game design. You've got a little bit of room to move and explore. And I think that kind of helped the pace of the game a little bit too. All the classic Duke Nukem weapons are here and they all feel right. The combat on the whole has just that pitch perfect feel, dodging slow missiles and aiming for that perfect pipe bomb placement. Every game needs pipe bombs, and I love the noise they make when you push the button, that little boop boop. Oh yeah, look, there's so many big guns with no reload time. I mean, this, this can't help but raise your own ego. And in fact, Duke's health is, is measured in ego, which increases the more bosses you take down and the more items you interact with in the world, such as throwing a frisbee at an enemy or checking out a load of porn. Time for an examination, ladies. And some of the interacting with objects stuff it feels like it, it was happened in 1998 when they were just impressed that you could interact with something like turn on the tap, you know, for no reason. Isn't yeah. that amazing? Wow. There's a lot of throwbacks too, like the way that Duke actually jumps in the mirrors. He keeps his arms by his side and his legs kind of swing about. <laughs> well, speaking of the jumping, actually, I, I liked some of the uh, the jumping puzzles, the, the sort of uh, pushing puzzles. It was a bit of platforming, which gives you a bit of a break from the pig shattering. How good is it fighting pigs again? And they look great. I thought some of the jetpack guys were a bit on the bland side though, but besides them and the creepy crawlies, there's not really many more enemies. And the enemies seem to come in waves of two, and whenever it's more than two, the 360 version seems to chug a bit. The boss fights are quite good, and they are challenging, but there is the odd one of them too which frames up, especially the three-boobed alien. I think I died more times in that one simply because of the frame rate issues. The good news is we were able to check out the PC version thanks to the demo, and even though it still suffers from some pretty ugly depth of field effects, everything else seems to run smoother and better. Yeah, look, it was the load times that really frustrated me, Barjo. It was like, um, you know, I was terrified of, of dying because, you know, for the threat of death was not the shame of being killed or having to restart from a checkpoint. You know, it was the fact that these enormous great load times, and, and usually in shooters, I've found the load times are instant or, or at least pretty quick, you know, mm. during a boss fight or if you're only a short way past the checkpoint. These were seriously terrible, terrible load times. Yeah, I clocked the 360 load times between 35 and 40 seconds, but on my rig on PC it was about 6 seconds, and that's a huge difference. I felt some of the areas had a bit of fat on them as well, a bit of fat in the ends, like the driving sections and the turret sections, maybe a little bit tedious. But even so, look, it was fun and addictive enough that it kept enticing me to return to it, and it's quite a generous length to the single-player campaign. But we should talk about the multiplayer game now, and not talk about how much you thrashed me at. Well, we don't need to talk about it, Bindi, because we can just show it. Humiliation. No, it, it was that it was that samurai helmet that you unlocked, Bajo. It gave you this massive advantage. It was very distracting, I'm afraid. <laughs> God, I mean, the only time I could kill Bajo was when he took a phone call, basically. I mean, we, we did have some fun uh, in between my deaths, you know, freezing and, and stomping each other. Stopping me mostly. Although there weren't enough maps for my liking, I think. Uh, but the ones that they included were very good fun. Yeah, and there was one there which was one of the original Duke 3D levels, but turned into a paintball arena. And I had a great time here, Bendy. It just took me back to my childhood. Ah! Yeah, it took me back to when I was about 29. There's standard deathmatch, team deathmatch, and king of the hill, but also the controversial capture the bait, which is like capture the flag, except you can still score if you don't have a babe at your base. Do you know you're totally getting a Doing this. The controversy with this mode is that while you're running with the babe, she'll put a hand in front of your face occasionally and you need to press X to slap her, which makes her take it away. Uh, ooh, how am I gonna explain that handprint? On the one side, you go into Duke Nukem knowing that it contains, you know, tits, bums and big guns, but on the other, I can't help but feel that some people may be offended by this. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, when you're trying to parody obnoxious sexist behaviour, there is a danger that if you don't quite get it right, you just end up doing exactly that. Mm. I mean, they could have probably chosen a different way from slapping to quieten the lass, you know, and still kept it fun, like maybe a sassy one-liner from Duke to calm her down. He's got enough of those. Can't you see where you're going? Round pants. Final thoughts, Bindi? Yeah, look, there's some good extras. 
there's a very frank developer's timeline which shows the tortuous process of making Duke, and I like that because it gave you an idea of just how much these guys went through to release this game. Overall, they got the Duke tone pretty right, I think. I enjoy humorous games, and there's plenty of that here. <sighs> Guess he won't be in the sequel. But I do want to give two separate scores for the console and the PC. Two scores? That's that's not allowed. <laughs> Budge, I, I'm the guest. I don't know your, your precious format. I, I want to give eight and a half rubber chickens to the PC version based on the demo. But the loading times on the 360 game, I, I'm afraid they just they kind of spoils it for me. I mean, because unlike the perfect good game host here with his leet skills, oh, I'm only human. Oh, sorry, and sometimes I die when I play shooters. And I don't like, I'm, I apologise, but that means I can really only give five and a half to the 360. Are you playing a sad violin? It's an invisible violin. I speak for the humans out here, <laughs> us who are not perfect. It's, it's annoying. Five and a half for the 360. Well, let's call that an average of seven then. <laughs> This replay value here with the big head mode, but more importantly, the way they uh, horizontally flip the entire level, it's kind of like playing it again, but your underpants are on backwards. It feels wrong, but it kind of feels right at the same time. I just had so much fun being Duke again. There was so much nostalgia here. You know, he's such a kick-ass character. He can take a missile to the face and still flip you the bird. I'm professional, I'm a fanboy, not fanboy, but oh my god, it's Duke Nukem! I can honestly say that I laughed more playing this game than any other game this year. So I'm giving eight and a half out of ten rubber chickens, admittedly with Duke goggles on. Him and his one score. Well, it's ten rubber chickens from me. Good game. So did you guess the game for this week? It was Brothers in Arms Road to Hill 30 for the PC from 2005, a tactical first-person shooter set during the Second World War developed by Gearbox Software, who were responsible for bringing Duke Nukem Forever back to life. Well, that's all we can possibly fit in a single episode, Bendy, so thank you very much for co-hosting and helping out while Hex is away. It was nothing. I wonder what she's doing. Fate is dealt Come see this. Gifts beyond measure. I need one of these for my living room. So cool. I'm sure she's working very hard. Yeah. Coming up on next week's show, I won't be here. And neither will I, because Hex will be bringing you an E3 special. Yes, uh, I can expect another invite in uh, 12 months' time then, can I? Bajo out. Bindi out. All right, give me a Pokemon. <laughs> mm. well, that's a big one.